Johnny Haig seemed such an unassuming little fellow. Small and slight, neat and polite, and being just a few weeks from 40, blessed with a boyish face, dimpled cheeks, and an unbroken voice. As he nibbled his toast and supped his tea, the quiet little choir boy, whose mummy had dressed him in bow ties, was still easy to see, but not the monster that he claimed to be. For the last few hours, the four men sat in the stuffy cramped confines of interview room three of Chelsea Police Station, and as Chief Superintendent Barrett, Divisional Detective Inspector Symes, and Detective Inspector Webb listened, little Johnny Haig candidly recounted his callous crimes with the calmness of a man for whom murder was routine. And as each delicious detail tickled him, his feeble moustache bristled. But behind the dark dots of his marble-like eyes, there was nothing. I have made some statements about the disappearance of Mrs. Duran Deacon. The truth is, we left the hotel together and she was inveigled by me into going to Crawley. Having taken her to the storeroom at Leopold Road, while she was examining some paper for use as fingernails, I shot her in the back of the head and disposed of her in a tank of acid. Having befriended the McSwan family and the Hendersons, assumed their identities, inherited their estates and drained their assets, all five had mysteriously vanished and almost no one had noticed. Any investigation would prove fruitless. Years had passed, evidence was sold, and with no fingerprints or witnesses, basing his murders on the legal loophole that Corpus delicti, with no body, there can be no crime. All that remained of his victims was a yellowy-green sludge. And so cocky in his confidence, Having already confessed to five perfect murders, John George Haig, one of Britain's most infamous serial killers, would now confess to a sixth. The how, the where, the when, every single detail. But without a body, the police could do nothing. Johnny was broke. Again. Having first fleeced the fortunes of the McSwan family and blown every penny in two and a half years, as the Hendersons' deaths had netted him a hefty £7,700, almost a quarter of a million pounds today, this should have been enough money to last a lifetime. Only, after just eight months, Johnny had squandered the lot. Of the three vices Johnny had, all would bleed him dry. As a bad gambler, he couldn't tell a dead cert from an old nag. As a wannabe entrepreneur, he couldn't see a done deal from a dodgy dud. And most bafflingly of all, although he never had an ounce of empathy for anyone but himself, this working-class boy aspired to be accepted by those he secretly despised. By the first week of February 1949, being neck deep in debt and having bounced his last check, owing six weeks back rent to the Onslow Court Hotel, who had told him to pay up or get out. The middle class reputation Johnny had cultivated was now in tatters. Business was bad. Nothing came of the silent jackhammer, the needle threader, the toy rocking horse, the battery powered fan, or any other silly idea he had no skills to build. And with Edward Jones, sick of his so-called partner's stupid schemes, Johnny's only other means of income had come to an end. As hard times bit hard, having sold Archie's Lagonda and Saloon 12, shamefully, this supreme swindler, who had been halfway to becoming a millionaire, scuttled back to his old tricks by illegally refinancing his Alvis for just 300 quid. Only now, being so in love with living the high life, this pittance wouldn't last him a day. But for Johnny, there was no going back. For this boy, born in the stark austerity of the Plymouth Brethren, there was nothing finer than sleeping on Indian linen sheets and taking tea and tiffin in the Tudor room of the Onslow Court Hotel. 
being swarmed by a wealth of lonely widows, easily ensnared by the cheeky charms of a harmless man. Here he was adored. But taking tea with Johnny was like putting a famished shark in a paddling pool. When I discovered there were easier ways to make a living, I did not ask myself whether I was doing right or wrong. That seemed to be irrelevant. I merely said, this is what I wish to do. If you're going to go wrong, go wrong in a big way. Go after women, rich old women who like a bit of flattery. That's your market. Mrs. Duran Deacon was blessed with an impressively regal name, which reflected her upper-middle-class status. Born on the 28th of February, 1880, she was christened Henrietta Helen Olivia Robards Fargus, although for brevity's sake, she preferred to be called Olive. As the first of five children to Henry, a prominent solicitor, and Helen, a solicitor's wife, raised amongst the royal parks in the wealthy borough of Richmond, with private tutors, four servants, and a nurse, the upbringing of Olive could easily be described as privileged. And although she had money, above everything else, she had morals. Being smart and fiercely independent, Olive was protective of her younger siblings. Being five foot ten and fourteen stone, as a stoutly built and strongly willed girl, she stood up to bullies, shielded the weak, and had a fire in her belly to fight for the rights of those less fortunate. Not an easy feat in an era where women were second-class citizens. By the death of Queen Victoria, one of Britain's wealthiest and most powerful women, the average woman had less rights than a horse. Education was limited, careers were denied, prospects beyond marriage and babies were bleak, and denied the right to vote, women had no say in their own lives. In 1903, infuriated at the ineffective women's groups, whose crusades culminated in a strongly worded letter to the all-male British government, Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters Sylvia and Christine set up the Women's Social and Political Union a small but powerful group who through deeds, not words, would fight, and if needed, die to give women the right to vote. One of the group was Olive. Refusing to be silenced and unfazed by the threat of arrest, in order to draw attention to their cause, they relied on new tactics, what they referred to as direct action, whether by heckling, threats or protests, hunger strikes, suicides, and even bombs. Under the name of Mrs. Drew, Olive was unabashed at her own direct actions. She was expelled from the Albert Hall for shouting down the First Lord of the Admiralty. She publicly harassed Prime Minister Herbert Asquith and Cabinet Minister Winston Churchill. And being a staunchly vocal and physical supporter of women's rights, she took part in the Black Friday protest of 1910 and two citywide campaigns of targeted criminal damage across the West End in November 1911 and March 1912. The second of which would land Olive in prison. On Monday the 4th of March 1912, at 8am, the Women's Social and Political Union congregated in Parliament Square for what their invite implied would be a series of speeches by well-known suffragettes. But in truth, this rally of little women was nothing but a cunning ruse. As the speeches began, in a simultaneous attack, over 150 women armed with hammers, stones and clubs smashed shop windows right across the West End. Olive and her pal the radical suffragette Maud Joachim broke six panes of glass at a jeweller's and a tea shop on Regent Street, causing £32 worth of damage. And although the press initially dubbed this as an act of mindless violence, it was actually a very calculated political statement, designed to prove that the government cared more about broken windows 
than a woman's life. As one of 126 women arrested, Olive spent five days in Holloway Prison, was fined £50, and was bound over for a year. But it was a small price to pay, as vowing to fight on until every last woman, regardless of class, wage or education, had the right to vote. By 1928, they had won. On the 13th of August 1918, 38-year-old Olive married Reginald Duran Deacon, a captain in the Gloucester Regiment who later became a wealthy London lawyer. And although a little late in life she had finally found love, standing true to her beliefs, her life would be good, but her fight would never be over. Unlike his other victims, a thin timid drip, a weak pair of old recluses, a bankrupt impulsive boozer, and a bedbound neurotic, Mrs. Duran Deacon would be no pushover. Compared to Johnny, she was taller, heavier, stronger, and a real force of nature who never let a mere man boss her about. But as Johnny knew, every victim had their fatal flaw, and hers was that she was lonely. After 20 years of wedded bliss, on the 25th of January 1938, Reginald died. With a will of £5,800, just over £360,000 today, her financial stability was assured. But a large pile of money is a poor substitute for the love, warmth and companionship of her beloved husband. And although she was lonely, she was never alone which was bad news for Johnny. Almost everything about Olive Duran Deacon made her unsuitable for his murderous plan. Olive was a well-known face in South Kensington's high society, who was liked by everyone and was an active participant in groups such as the Six Points Women's Suffrage, the Francis Bacon Society, Christian Science, and the Solicitors and Artists Benevolent Fund, all of which she gave sizable donations. Olive was predictable, a precise and punctual lady who disliked surprises and rarely deviated from her schedule that she openly discussed with her closest friend, Constance Lane. And hating waste, she always informed the staff at the Onslow Court Hotel if she ever planned to be away, which was rare or late. Olive was easy to spot as a tall, broad and regal looking lady who turned heads in her royal blue dress black Persian lamb coat, large black hat, tortoiseshell spectacles, and a bright red handbag, who was never without her twin set of pearls, pearl-studded earrings, five rings studded with rubies, sapphires, and diamonds, and a large Russian crucifix on a gold chain. Wherever she walked, she sparkled. But worse still for Johnny, her disappearance would be entirely out of character and unexpected. Olive was an honourable lady. She had no vices, debts or enemies. She lived sensibly, spent frugally, and although she tipped well, she never withdrew more than £5 per week to cover her needs. And with no psychological issues, as an older, overweight lady, she had no major medical problems, except for gallstones, which gave her a mild stomachache, and a new set of dentures she had recently had fitted. As his next victim, she was entirely unsuitable. Only Johnny was blindsided by one bright shining detail. Olive was rich, very rich, as having been bequeathed a small fortune by her late husband. As a savvy businesswoman, Olive had turned £5,800 into £37,000. She was a lonely widow who today would be worth 1.2 million pounds. To Johnny, he had hit the jackpot, and all it took was a little flattery. She was inveigled by me into going to Crawley. Having taken her into the storeroom at Leopold Road, while she was examining some paper for use as fingernails, 
I shot her in the back of the head. Following that, I removed her coat, jewellery, and disposed of her in a tank of acid. Oh, I should have said that, in between, I went round to a cafe for a cup of tea and scrambled egg. But she was so strong, so confident, and so feisty. She was a fiery independent woman who harangued prime ministers, smashed shop windows, and scrapped in the street with the police. So was her death really that simple? Well, yes, it was. With his first five deaths at Oddle, and his sixth easy-peasy, having learned his lessons, murder really had become routine for Johnny. As always, he had made a few cock-ups here and there. Only this time, with his cocky calmness replaced by an impulsive recklessness, his mistakes weren't just big, they were stupid. This time, his crime had witnesses. Friday the 18th of February 1949 was Olive's last day alive. As usual, she took tea with Constance Lane in the small but tightly packed Tudor room. Olive said, I am going down to Mr. Haig's place in Crawley, where he experiments on different things. Her appointment was at 2.30, and the time was ten past two. At 2.15pm, Hilda Kirkwood, the hotel's bookkeeper, witnessed Johnny leave via the front door, enter his garage at Mansion Mews, and drive two and a half miles east in his dark blue Alvis. Which was odd, as he was meant to meet Olive in 15 minutes. At 2.15pm, distinctively dressed in a royal blue dress, a large black hat, a black Persian fur coat, two pearl necklaces and a bright red handbag, Hilda watched as Olive hailed a cab and headed in the same direction. His plan was simple. As before, by meeting in a pre-arranged place, Johnny could ensure he was never seen with any victim on the day they died. Only having picked up Olive, he was spotted. Twice. First at 3.45pm, as Johnny's 20 horsepower Alvis trundled past Morris Loudner's garage at Povey Cross. The owner, who knew him well, having serviced his car on many occasions, saw Johnny drive his Alvis towards Crawley. And in the front seat, a lady who fitted Olive's description. At a little after 4pm, Olive needed to use the loo, so they stopped off at the George a local hotel, where for the last five years, Johnny had often slept and ate. And having politely asked, Would you mind if I used a bathroom? The manager, Hannah Kaplan, would later positively identify Mrs. Duran Deacon and Johnny Haig. Just three streets from Leopold Road, and a few moments before her death. with Symes and Barrett having stepped away a while ago, as Haig concluded his confession to Detective Inspector Webb. Although his mouth grinned, the soulless glare of his cold dead eyes gave away nothing. Mrs. Durandi can no longer exist. She has disappeared completely, and no trace of her can ever be found. How can you prove a murder if there is no body? But there was one thing that Johnny didn't know. The police were one step ahead. Being a master of silence, Webb waited until Johnny had run out of things to say and segued into small talk. Hey, guest. So, where were the other two? Suitably baited, Webb replied, Well, they shouldn't be very long now. They've got a fair way to come leaving that little morsel dangling on a hook. They've been a long time, haven't they? Where are they coming from? And with that, Johnny fell into Webb's trap. Oh, they've been down to Crawley. Johnny didn't react. No smile, no blink, no wince. 
Just a single, solitary gulp. But what could they prove? Nothing. For Johnny, the evening of Olive's death was just like any other. Disposal had become automatic by then. It was a fatiguing business getting a 14-stone carcass into an oil drum on one's own. It took me two hours. So hungry and tired, he had tea, toast, scrambled egg, a good night's sleep, and the next morning pumped the drum four-fifths full of acid and left. There was blood on the walls, a handbag on the floor, tortoise-shell spectacles on the bench, and a dead body dissolving in a drum. But with so much money to spend, Johnny was gone. And yet, before his cunning subterfuge of writing letters to lawyers and siblings began, it all took an unexpected turn. On the afternoon of Sunday the 20th of February, Constance Lane, a long-term resident at the Onslow Court Hotel, walked into Chelsea Police Station and reported her close friend, Olive Durand Deacon, as missing. And she was aided by Johnny Haig. Eager to limit the damage, as Police Sergeant Dale took down Olive's particulars, Johnny vainly barked, You have written down Mrs Lane's name and address, but you haven't asked for mine. I think you should. A decision that would prove fatal, as being so prominent in South Kensington's high society, her disappearance made the papers. And so did Johnny's name, a detail which didn't go unnoticed by Arnold Berlin. On Monday the 21st, three days had passed, but still the body hadn't dissolved. I returned to Crawley to find the reaction almost complete, but a piece of fat and bone was still floating in the sludge. Having pumped the drum four-fifths full of acid, although her flesh, muscles and bones had dissolved into a black acrid soup, parts of her left foot still bobbed about on the thick sticky surface of the yellowy green gloop. I emptied off the sludge with a bucket and pumped a further 10 gallons of acid into the tank to decompose the remaining flesh and bone, having tossed in her red handbag for good measure. A day later, I dumped it in the yard. And with that, the body was gone, evidence was destroyed, and Mrs. Durand Deacon had vanished. But the police were closing in. As a matter of routine in a missing persons case, WPS Alexandra Lamborn questioned everyone at the Onslow Court Hotel. Their answers were solid, but one resident stood out. As being too eager to tell his side of the story, although this neat little man came across as harmless, something about him caused her skin to crawl, and unhappy with his answers, she alerted her boss, Detective Inspector Albert Webb. Across the week, Johnny volunteered several statements in connection to her disappearance But with his details vague, his facts shifting, and his eyes cold and unemotional, having pulled his criminal record, although he had no history of violence, the detectives were left in no doubt that they were dealing with a fraudster, a forger, and a professional liar. So treading carefully, they brought him in for questioning. But instead of being free to speak, as Webb awaited his colleague's return, For the first two hours, all they did was sit and wait in silence. Exuding the calmness of a man who knew he would never be caught, Johnny supped his tea, nibbled his toast, and even had a snooze. But the delay was deliberate, and being so desperate to show off just how clever he really was, although he would brazenly confess to six perfect murders, by waiting... This gave Barrett and Symes more than enough time to examine the storeroom at Leopold Road. Given permission by Edward Jones to break the lock, everything was as Johnny had left it a few days prior. His cleanup wasn't even slapdash, 
It was non-existent. But he knew he didn't need it to be. With the later investigation, headed up by Home Office pathologist Dr. Keith Simpson and Detective Chief Inspector Guy Mahon, inside they found three carboys of acid, an Enfield Mark I revolver, 11 rounds of 38 caliber ammunition, a rubber apron, a set of rubber gauntlets, an army issue gas mask, several items marked with a large monogrammed H, 10 strips of rubber cellophane, believed to be a prototype for artificial fingernails, a broken monocle, a spatter of blood-stained whitewash removed from between two windows, an attaché case full of passports, driving licenses, identity cards, ration books, and marriage certificates, all in the names of William Donald McSwan, Donald McSwan, Amy McSwan, Archibald Henderson and Rosalie Henderson. And outside in the yard, three 40-gallon steel drums, two badly rusted and one nearly new but empty and dry, and a large quantity of yellowy-green sludge. It was a wealth of evidence, but it was all circumstantial. And it wasn't a body. From the basement at 79 Gloucester Road, they recovered some unspecified sludge from inside the manhole and an old worn-out axe gifted by Johnny to the estate agent Albert Marshall. From room 404 of the Onslow Court Hotel, they found a large stash of personal possessions belonging to all six victims, including Max Typewriter, Archie Suits, every piece of forged paperwork relating to the theft of their estates, a shopping list written in Johnny's handwriting for a drum, acid, stirrup pump, gloves, apron, rags, cotton wool, red paper, etc. And amongst his dirty linen, they found a bloodied shirt. And although he fully confessed, that must be Mrs. Durand Deacon's blood. I was wearing that shirt when I shot her. Again, it was circumstantial evidence, but it wasn't a body. After a painstaking examination of the yard at Leopold Road, having sieved 400 pounds of soil, the police found the smashed frames of Olive's spectacles and the plastic handle of her red handbag, as well as several fragments of bone identified as the left foot of an elderly human female. The broken pieces of Olive's dentures identified by her dentist. And amazingly, even what they believed was one of her gallstones. But once again, it wasn't a body. In fact, with everything having been dissolved into an unrecognizable stew, these random bits of a dead woman were as close as the police would ever come to finding the remains of Mrs. Durand Deacon. When shown all of the legal letters he had forged, although Johnny Cockley crowed, Yes, I wrote all of the signatures. Even going as far to quip, I signed Mac's name. I remember I didn't make a good job of it. Instead of Donald, I wrote Ponald. Even his diary, in which he had celebrated each killing with an initial, A is for Archie, R is for Rose. Knowing that, with no body, there could be no crime. As circumstantial evidence, it meant nothing. He had given the police everything, and having confessed to the murders of six innocent people, the McSwans, the Hendersons and Mrs. Duran Deacon, John George Haig, one of Britain's most infamous serial killers, would never be convicted. Or so he thought. Across his six supposedly perfect murders, little Johnny Haig had made a lot of mistakes, many of which he had miraculously got away with. And although many were big, they were not the biggest. As back in Lincoln Prison, on the day he had concocted his murderous plan, he had made a fatal mistake. Back in interview room three at Chelsea Police Station, bored of waiting, Johnny impatiently pressed, What are they doing now? Symes and Barrett, I mean. Well, John, 
I don't really know, but I should imagine they're working hard in order to get you hanged. Hanged? What on earth for? Oh, you know very well that they only hang people for one reason in this country. Don't you, John? And he did. But having once read in a law book about corpus delicti, Johnny knew. You can't prove that I murdered anybody. You can't prove a murder without a body. Webb retorted. Oh, yes, you can. And as Webb listed two famous trials off the top of his head, with that cocky grin firmly wiped off his smug little face, Johnny gulped. Corpus delicti. With no body, there can be no crime. But his mistake was to assume that by body, the law meant a human body. But it doesn't. It means body of evidence. All the police needed was enough circumstantial evidence to prove where the victim had been, how they had died and been disposed of, and more importantly, who had killed them. And having confessed to six murders, including Mrs. Duran Deacon's, Johnny had given the police everything. On the 2nd of March 1949, Johnny was charged with the murder of Henrietta Helen Olivia Robards Duran Deacon, to which he replied, I have nothing to say. The irony lost on him. As many moons before, he had boasted to his cellmate, Who can tell if a murder has taken place, if a person completely disappears? Only the murderer would know, and if he kept his mouth shut, he would be safe. On the 18th of July 1949, at Sussex Assizes, he pleaded his innocence. But after a two-day trial, and having deliberated for just 17 minutes, a unanimous jury found him guilty, and he was sentenced to death. On Wednesday the 10th of August 1949, at 9am, taking just seven seconds from the opening of the cell door to his little torso dangling from a taut hemp rope, a seasoned executioner, Albert Pierpoint, perched the tiny trembling monster on a chalk X. Granted no last words, no final requests, no quickie cigarette, no speeches, no bullshit, and no time for tears. With his last ever sight, blocked by a thick white hood. As his skilled slayer pulled the lever, the trapdoors parted, and as his little body plunged seven feet and four inches into a dark cold void, as the hemp rope tugged tight, the two top vertebrae of his neck snapped to the right, and little Johnny Haig was dead. And with that, the killing spree of John George Haig one of Britain's most infamous serial killers, finally came to an end. But was his death really that simple? Well, yes, it was. Friends, Thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. That was the final part of Sulfuric, the true story of John George Haig. With the omnibus edition of the series and a special Q&A episode rolling out next week to mark the end of the season. A big thank you to my new Patreon supporter, Mir Razavi, as well as a big thank you to Juliet Nostalgia Knits for sending me a lovely pair of hand-knitted socks. Very cosy indeed and April McLucas and Emily Locke for the very kind donations they sent via the Murder Mile website. I promise you, it will all be spent on beer and cake. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. wasn't too bad that wasn't too bad oh dear lord right <coughs> hello everyone hello everyone hello everyone hello everyone
welcome to Extra Mile. Last basic Extra Mile for the uh, for the year. Last Murder Mile episode for the year. I mean, it is the end of the year, but, you know, end of the season as well. Uh, as, as always, to new people, hope you're all well. Thank you for staying for Extra Mile. This is the extra bit at the end of the episode. I'm being a bit, a bit quiet today. As with last week, I've got a um, new guy moored up next to me. Um, uh, so it's it's early in the morning. I got up really early this morning again because I wanted to record uh, just because it's 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 a, it's a Saturday before Christmas starts. It's twenty twenty first today, I think, and there's going to be a lot of people moving boats, trying to find their positions. Uh, <coughs> but I woke up this morning; it was really rainy. And I was like, "Oh, sod it! I'll just do it anyway." Or there's a big, big, huge industrial fan outside as well. And it's like, so I'm, I, I tried to capture that noise so I could kind of drown it out later on. It's all very dull and boring and technical. Anyway, here we go. Uh, I'm going to put on a tea. I've got my coffee here. Um, uh, so I'm going to make, make myself a tea. It's, it's, we're we're going to go quiet for a little bit. And I've got a cake as well. This is exciting. Because it's, do you know what? I'm celebrating the end of Murder Mile. Oh, I'm looking forward to um, just having a bit of, bit of rest. So let's, let's just do this now. Is try not to make too much noise. There's the water going in. The water going in the kettle. Glug, glug, glug. Glug, glug, glug. Lid on. Ketley tea. One bag. Sugar. Two spoons. Coffee made powdered milk. One spoon. Well, one and a half spoons. There we go, that's how I make my tea, builder's tea. And, oh, look at that. Look at this. Look at these beauties. Belgian buns. Belgian buns. They're not, they're not the ones from uh, 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 Griselda's, the really nice, uh, uh, the Jewish bakery over in Stamford Hill. Oh, they make great. Oh, yes. They're big and thick and gooey and they're soft. And uh, the cinnamon is, there's a lot, of, a lot of cinnamon in it. And the glassy cherry is good and the icing is good. And, it's, and they're not too expensive either, but they're decent, yeah. These are kind of more mass-produced ones from Tesco's, but they will go down a treat. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to those. Whew, so, um, uh, this will be, if you're listening to this when it goes out, uh, this will be Boxing Day. So you've, you would have had your Christmas. So I hope you all had a very good Christmas. Uh, it's still Christmas now, technically. If if you were uh, uh, emergency services or, um, I think I said this last year, but, uh, do you know, Merry Christmas to everyone who works Christmas Day. I have worked Christmas Day. Uh, I didn't, I wasn't doing a proper job. I was working in telly. Uh, it's not really a proper job. I just had to make sure that th- nothing really cocked up. Uh, which I was too busy. I, to, I'll be honest. I was too busy watching Empire Strikes Back and having to fry up, uh, <laughs> which is why so, something really major happened on my watch many, many years ago. I won't go into it now, but uh, yeah, so, something very bad happened at the BBC, and part of that was uh, down to me uh, not doing my job properly. Uh, yeah, they got into a lot of trouble with it. Basically, it was down to the fact that I was watching Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> anyway, we won't go into that. It's a big thing big thing yeah got into a lot of trouble didn't lose my job one of the one of the many times i should have lost my job but didn't lose my job anyway we won't get, go into that maybe that's for another podcast uh so i just wanted to say uh if you are uh, emergency workers or anyone working over christmas uh truck drivers all, all the people my granddad was a truck driver as i mentioned so do you know uh, uh merry christmas to everyone who worked over christmas and is continuing to work over christmas to make sure that everything runs runs smoothly for everyone else sitting on your ass having a lovely time merry christmas uh how, enjoy the heat sweats uh by this point i haven't actually pigged out yet because obviously this is four days before christmas i'm recording this um i've already picked up uh, I went up to visit my gran uh, in Scotland. I do that every month to make sure she's okay. Uh, and I, I uh, she doesn't know who I am anymore, but I, I always go up to check that she's okay. And uh, But she, the only way I can get a reaction out of her is to give her chocolate. She loves dairy milk chocolate. Uh, so I, I always bring her up loads and loads of uh, chocolate bars to keep her going, of which her drawer is stacked full. And I also bought her some big they've got some big kilo bars of dairy milk at the moment so i bought a couple of those and i I thought because i bought so many i thought i'll have one for myself as well i mean i bought it so i've got one of those got i'm i'm stocking up on my beer so um 
can have a nice simple Christmas this year. Uh, I know everyone like goes, oh, let's do a family thing. I always do the family thing and it's all very nice, but this year I wanted to have my own Christmas. I haven't had a Christmas by myself on the boat. I've always, it's all, I've always gone and visited friends, but I've never had a, a myself. I, I, I like my own company. Uh, so uh, it'll be me, just me by myself, wake up on Christmas morning, uh, switch the fire on, uh, I'll do my calls to family and all stuff like that and then uh, I'm gonna have, probably have some bacon sandwiches yep not not a very vegan thing but it's Christmas Day gonna have some beers chocolates gonna line up loads of movies no real plans not gonna do very much uh, and that's what it's about uh, no pressure that's what I want to do so uh, I, I might go to Oxford Street and film myself on on the deserted streets because Oxford Street will be empty so I might do that probably go to the pub probably do my usual thing go to the theater on boxing day i like that because no one's there and you can get some cheap deals uh saw some good things i've seen i've seen the, the live version of the lady killers that was really good uh i can't remember what i saw last year hopefully this i was going to go and see the, the the live version of the man in the white suit uh with stephen mangan but it's shut down oh it's really annoying uh anyway uh so i've got one more episode to do which is the q a episode so just to say I'm going to record that probably the day after Boxing Day. So if you're listening to this Boxing Day and you have any questions, email me. Yeah, probably email me is best. Or if you're on my for- on my forums, post it on there. That's fine. I'll-, I'll answer the question. Or what you can do is you can record it as long as it's short, not too long. I'll play out your your message uh, and you know send it to me. Uh, there- there's a service called WeTransfer. You can send it to my email address and I'll, I'll upload it. Uh, so that'll be that that's boxing day and then, and then it's done and then i get i get a couple of weeks off which i'm looking forward to and then i'm back in the archive which i love doing uh looking forward to that tea's almost i'm gonna i'm not gonna let it boil lovely great okie koki so i hope you enjoyed that that was uh sort of not not me making the tea uh, that was sulfuric that was done that was a six-parter uh smaller than the other series but e- equally as hard really difficult episodes to write uh especially, especially just because Hague doesn't really give a lot away um so it's very much about trying to dive into it and find out who he was, what he's about, and really try and get across who he is and his perspective. But, you know, you read a lot of his statements, and it's it's not like uh, Christie, who would uh, talk for hours and hours. And was very, you know, with, with Haig, he's very, Haig is very vague. Uh, I should have put that in. Vague Haig. Um... So what, I, and also the story has been told many times. So what I tried to do again was to give a very different perspective. It was I quite enjoyed writing it from uh, the killer perspective for once, rather than just the victims. Obviously, if this was a victims' story, uh, it'd be a very different episode. But I wanted to give you something different. Uh, and also, you know, a lot of people, you know, I, I read a lot of things about Haig and people are always like, you know, oh, do you know, he's perfect murders or da, da, da. But that's what I wanted to really get through this was the fact that it's not. It's he's an annoying, arrogant, little stupid little man with a with a, a, a flawed plan right from the start. He makes so many mistakes and he's just lucky. He's lucky all the way through. Do you know, he, he makes out that because it's his big grand plan, but it's not. It's luck all the way through. It's luck and bravado. And, do you know, um, especially with the first three victims, the McSwans, they're quite insular. They're quite reclusive. Do you know, they're not the people who kind of go, oi, 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 like that. Do you know, they're quite quiet, which is, uh, do you know, that's why he got away with so many of those is that they, they, they were recluses. They didn't go out much. They didn't socialize much. They didn't talk much. You know, it was, and with um, with the Hendersons, I mean, they had their own problems going on. You know, alcoholics, depressed, suicidal, bed bound. I mean, there's a debt ridden. There's a lot going on there. So, um, um, and and then obviously you come to Mrs. Durand Deacon, who's obviously a very full and well rounded woman, and uh, 
even though uh, he was almost caught out by Arnold Berlin, who was one of the people he misjudged again in this episode. He's misjudged another person. He's looked at Constance Lane, her friend, who's not a relative, not going to affect him with terms of power of attorney. Looks at her, she's just an old lady, doesn't have much money, doesn't think doesn't think that much about her, but really she's kind of important. I kind of glossed over a little bit uh, in the story, just for, just for the sake of speed, because the episode was getting quite long, and I really wanted to keep it at a... This will probably be a 40 minute but it was getting up to like an hour, and uh, I just didn't... I, I felt it needed to progress quickly. So, one of the things I would have... I, I took out was that um, the day after the murder, he went back to the Onslow Court Hotel... And Constance Lane was there, and she was like, "Where's Where's Olive? She's normally here for breakfast." And he was like, "Oh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I haven't seen her." And uh, Constance was like, "Well, you were going to meet her yesterday. At uh, she was going to come down to your um, your storeroom." And he was like, "Yeah, I know. I waited for her for like five or ten minutes outside the Army and Navy stores, but she just didn't show up." And then Constance was like, "Oh, okay, that's that's odd." They, they checked her room. She had, her bed hadn't been slept in. Uh, so they kind of asked around but there was not really a lot going on anyway the next day Constance was like okay well she's been missing almost coming up for 48 hours now this is totally unlike it I want to go to the police station I'm going to report and uh, Hager was like oh don't worry about it I will do that for you don't worry at all I'm all over this and uh, I'm sure there's no problem at all uh, but he was trying to put it off and then throughout the day she was going right I'm going to the police station and it got to the point where she was going to go anyway there was nothing he could do about it. So what he was like, he was like, right, well, I'll go with you and, uh, you know, I'll give my side of the story. Which you heard about there where he was like, he was like, you've taken down her night, her name, but what about mine? It's like, um, uh, he wanted to try and get control of something that he had no control of. But also he's, he's quite, he's quite vain about it. He wants to, he wants to control everything and, and be, the, you know, the the king of it all uh so so that's actually why she uh he ended up being one of the people who reported her missing and she would uh, obviously mrs duran deacon was one of the first the, the the only victim to be reported missing he was close so many times but this is the only time and literally he just couldn't stop her he could have killed her but i mean this is just conjecture but in his eyes she wasn't worth anything she's worth nothing she's worth no money so why waste the time trying to kill her uh, and also, also, I mean, he was he was sloppy by that point already. Uh, I I took this out as well. He'd uh, I, well, I referenced it. He tried to. There were several ladies who he tried to lure back to um, his storeroom at Leopold Road. They weren't as wealthy as Mrs. Duran Deacon. They were l uh, more suspicious of him. Many of them just either said no or put him off or didn't turn up. So uh, there was a couple of ladies. I, I, I didn't put their names in there. I, 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 what what I realised is that if I give you too many names, it, it can really confuse things up. And sometimes, like, if I give you a name, you might go, oh, that's important, but it might not be. So quite often I'll streamline some of the details just so it doesn't... Um, <coughs> just so it doesn't bombard you, especially with an episode like this, which is which is quite dense. We did a lot of the investigation in the previous episode deliberately because I knew that this episode had a lot of facts that we were going to keep coming back to so uh it's going to be a bugger to edit i'll tell you that much i've got three days to edit it i've got to, I, my my goal was to get this done before christmas because i didn't want to be editing on christmas eve or, or, or on christmas day right um here's some things that i found uh, about life at onslow court uh one of the waitresses there kathleen murray uh she worked there with her brother john uh part of her duties uh was to take John George Haig, a cup of tea to his room in the morning. Uh, she said he was always asleep and used to grumble if I woke him up. He was very friendly with the staff, staff and residents and he was courting Miss Diane Eden. Now she was a lady who uh, uh, did work at the hotel for a while uh, but she left uh, April 1948. Uh, this was obviously while he was seeing uh, Barbara Stevens who was Alan Stevens' daughter. I haven't referenced her much in here. I... I was going to do a whole piece about him and his relationships and him and his him and his parents but in the end I felt it was just better to focus on his mistakes that's what the episode became when I when when I start this project I really I didn't know where it was going to go I knew roughly what I was going to write about and the, and what the episodes would be but I didn't know really what the theme would be and then 
it wasn't until I really got into episode two that I was like, ah, this is about, I knew it was about his, him feeling superior and, uh, you know, his superiority complex, but really what it was about, and it was about his superiority complex and the fact that he made a lot of mistakes, but it's not the big mistake that he finally made at the end. Uh, uh, there was a chambermaid who worked at the Onslow Court Hotel as well called Margaret Moran. She was an Aussie. Good eye, mate. Good accent there. Uh, she said that he would often leave uh, to go to Crawley between Friday and Monday, which is why he would stay at the uh, the George Hotel in Crawley, which was where uh, he took Mrs. Duran De- Deacon to have a wee-wee before she was murdered, uh, which is where she was spotted. Uh, he was staying there that night. He would do it because it's only, it's only about like half a mile from his storeroom. Uh, Margaret Moran said that he would often return and his suits would be grimy and oily. Obviously, this is in an era when where all men wore suits you know that was even even if you were shoveling coal or something you'd, you'd be wearing a suit not a nice suit but you'd, you know, that's what everyone wore with suits uh there wasn't really jeans by that point or, or casuals uh and she said he would uh sponge off the griminess and the oil in the wash basin before sending it to the cleaners stating i was under a car uh let's see if there's anything about mrs duran deacon that was there so obviously she was henrietta helen olivia robards fargus later uh duran deacon uh also known as olive uh she was 68 at the time of the murders but she looked around 58 uh oldest child uh as mentioned father was uh, a prominent uh solicitor which is uh, where they believe that uh, she may have met her husband uh uh because he would later go on become become a lawyer as well uh strong mother strong father she was the older sister protected her siblings uh she uh, even up to the day she died she was still pretty close to uh, her father died uh, relatively earlier on but uh, she was still pretty close to her siblings uh, especially esme who was the youngest she would see her at least once a week uh, da, 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 da. uh everyone said she was a delightful woman thoughtful caring passionate about her causes she was well mannered polite uh as mentioned she gave to lots of charities but she didn't suffer fools gladly uh she didn't like people who had no manners which is probably why she liked haig because he was always polite didn't swear always please and thank you uh she would always cut rude people short she was a meticulous woman about five foot ten uh, Haig was five for eight. She was about fourteen stone. He was uh, just over ten, I believe. I haven't got my facts in front of me. Uh, obviously, mentioned that she was a, a big part of the women's suffrage. Obviously, she wasn't one of the biggies, but she, uh, you know, she she played an important part in the women's suffrage movement. Uh, which was key of kind of you know, 1903, 1905, 1910, 1912, right up to 1918 when. Uh, when they finally caused a change which would cause women in England, Wales, Scotland, but not Northern Ireland, uh, to get the vote. But this was only women of uh, certain academic, uh, like if, if they were, um, uh, if they were university graduates. So that was 1918. But it would, it would take at least another 10 years before they would finally get to say all women get the vote regardless of their, well, age was 18 and above so anyone 18 and above uh, but regardless of status class uh, education or, or or sorry marital status as well which was important before because women only really had rights if they were married uh so um obviously we mentioned about uh black friday she was a little part of the black friday protest um that's quite interesting if you if you're if you're interested in things like that i'm kind of reading a lot more about um uh, the suffragette mu- movement at the moment i find it really fascinating about about the the about the, the use of direct action uh black friday protest is pretty interesting uh i but i was trying to focus here really on the uh the the the, the campaign i didn't know about this i knew about the campaign of which they went through the west end smashing windows but um I, I don't know why. In my head, I thought it was a, a kind of a protest against corsets and things like that. Do you know, things things that they saw that uh, were kind of oppressive to women, do you know, having to wear corsets and you know, being, do you know, uh, held in by certain things. But it wasn't. It was it was a, a, a tactical protest to um, smash 
a shit ton of windows in the West End. So the government would come out and go, this is disgraceful, blah, blah, blah. All these windows, which actually did happen. They came out and they got all these business leaders together and said, how are we going to fund your your broken windows and all that? And it's exactly what the, what the suffragists wanted. They wanted a big upcry of all the business leaders and the government going, oh, oh, we're sorry about your smashed windows when really this was about, you know, about women and their rights. And um, the government basically fell into their trap. Uh, so let's just try and get um, this bit. Oh yeah, okay. Ah, uh, here we are. So, uh, da, 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 da. so obviously, uh, the the, the uh, women's social and political union were doing the 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 mass breaking of windows across the West End. Uh, these included windows even on 10 Downing Street. This was back in the days when on 10 Downing Street, where the Prime Minister lives, uh, the, the the gates weren't there. You literally you could walk down that street. Anyone could go down there. There would have been a police police on patrol, but there was no private gates to protect them. So 150 women in central London smashing windows. Um, uh, Olive and Maud Joachim, who was a staunch suffragette, uh, she's quite she's relatively famous. If you go online, you can see a lot about her. Uh, they broke six plate glass windows at 76 and 78 Regent Street, which belonged to William Morelace Burt. Uh, it was actually a jeweler's. I had to do a bit of research because I don't like not knowing what the buildings are. Uh, it was originally a jeweler's called Charles Packer and Co. And there was also two windows smashed at 74 Regent Street, which was owned by Callard, Stewart and Watt, uh, which was a tea room. I thought that was quite interesting because I thought, I, as I said, I thought these were going to be kind of uh, corset shops and things like that. Things about or, or kind of kind of uh, uh, you know, lewd art or things like that. But it wasn't. It was just they, they'd really had picked kind of random places. But uh but it was it was it was not about the the places they were picking. It was about about the statement they were trying to make. Uh, so on, uh, so they were sent to Holloway Prison for five days to wait until they were committed for trial at Bow Street Magistrates Court. Uh, that trial happened on the twenty eighth of March. Uh, Maud, uh, Maud uh, Olive pleaded guilty, um, but she was. Uh, her, but her father, who obviously was a prominent solicitor, pe- came in and paid the fifty pounds bail. That's a lot of money back then. He paid a big bill, substantial amount of bail, uh, if she agreed to keep the peace for twelve months. Uh, whereas Maud, uh, because Maud had a prior conviction, uh, she was also found guilty, and she ended up serving six months. Uh, if you look at um, all of the hundred and twenty-six women who were arrested uh, for the. Um, what, well, what they called the Great Militant Protest, which is the big smashing of the streets. Of the 126, there was about 78, I think my figures might be wrong, 76 or 78, uh, uh, who ended up serving jail time, and that was because they were working class. So I, I, either because they had prior convictions, but what they, what they looked at and they went, hang on, this is really unfair. Um, all the middle class and upper class women who've been smashing all the windows as well are being let off with bail, whereas all the working class women are being convicted and sent to like six months to a year in prison. Uh, so this is one of the things that um, Olive was uh, fighting about as well, was the fact that it, it wasn't just inequality between the sexes, it was an inequality between uh, the uh, 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 people's financial status or their 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 um, statuses status. My brain is gone. It's because I'm looking at cake, and that's why. Uh, so as mentioned, yet yeah, she was still active in the suffragette movement right right up to the end of her life. Um, I'm going to try and whiz through a lot of stuff just because there's a lot in here that I really want to get to. Um, some of the things, because there are some things that I kind of had to gloss over a bit. As mentioned, she was quite a frugal lady. Uh, not frugal in the terms of what the McSwans were, but, you know, um, obviously she got an, uh, an estate at the end of her life. Her estate was worth £36,808, which, as mentioned, was £1.2 million today. Obviously, in that era, you know, you'd be able to buy the average like the average house i think i was looking online the average house was about seventeen thousand pounds in london so you equate that now that even though that's 1.2 million pounds today forget it that's that's like that's a lot of money we're talking like in today's money really 
if you're going to spend it, that'd be about five million. So, uh, so she was she was really wealthy, but she didn't flash the cash. She's living in not an exclusive place, not a high rent place, but kind of a nice place. Because of this, she was able to give herself an annual income of one thousand pounds, which in today's money would be about seventy five thousand pounds. She hadn't got uh, she hadn't got a mortgage anywhere. She hadn't got children. Um, so really, she was just looking after herself. Her father had died. He'd got a modest estate, but, you know, it wasn't a fortune. So basically, um, she got all the money from her dead husband, who was a lawyer. I th- what did I say that was? Like £5,800? And she turned that into £36,000. This was all through sound investments by herself. Do you know, she... Um, she spoke to a lot of prominent businessmen you know she made a lot of uh shrewd investments herself she wasn't rash in any way um all of in her bank account she would only ever have around 500 pounds uh ever that was the maximum she'd ever have there and she only took out about five pounds a week just to cover her expenses uh she everyone said she, t- she tipped well but you know she wasn't extravagant for herself even some of her jewelry when you look at her jewelry she's got I mentioned about all of the, the, the rubies and sapphires and the rings and the pearl necklaces and all things like that. But some of the pieces she wore were just made of paste. They, they, they were kind of um, really cheap, the kind of the things that you'd, you know, you'd find at Claire's accessories. But she liked them, do you know. She, so she, she wasn't all about show, do you know. She dressed well, but she, you know, she wore the things she liked. Uh, what else we got? What else we got? As mentioned in there, yeah, uh, uh, Johnny got up to his old tricks. He was re- he and even though remember this is where he started right at the start with his early crimes, where he was refinancing cars. So he would uh, he would get a car, he would uh, refinance it on higher purchase, which means it was uh, it was being he was buying it, uh, loaning it out. But then he would sell off the car to someone else and then refinance it elsewhere. So it was multiple crimes, which is why when, when he got first arrested. And he was doing this with his Alvis. So at the time of his, the time of the murder, his Alvis wasn't his Alvis anymore. He had sold it on to, oh, I've got it here somewhere, George Phillips. Uh, whether he existed, we don't actually know. But that was, uh, he lived in Paddington. Uh, and uh, so he'd sold the car and then he'd refinanced it for 300 quid, which wasn't a lot of money for as mentioned for Johnny in that era, but do you know what? He was struggling by this point. He, he literally, he was selling off loads of crap here and there, selling off their personal possessions. Uh, he'd he'd even taken from uh, 16 Doors Road, he'd taken a metal filing cabinet, some office chairs, uh, an electric heater, do you know? And he was selling it all off. Anything he could get his hands off, he'd flog off just to live his life. Uh, because he was used to this kind of way of living. Quick slurp. I removed this from the story as well. This is quite big in the in the in the case file itself, but I removed this as well. Um, he was actually cited. Remember, I mentioned that he was driving down to Crawley with Mrs. Duran Deacon in the car and Morris Loud Landauer Landauer his real name Morris Landauer actually the owner of the garage at Povey Cross actually saw him and recognised him. Uh, that happened a couple of times. So um, Carol Con- Congden. Congdon, that's a name. Carol Mary Congdon, who was employed by Morris at the Povey Cross garage. Uh, it's, it's actually in Hawley, just outside Crawley. Hawley outside Crawley. Uh, on the 18th of February 1949, so the day that she was murdered, at 1 pm, so that's one and a half hours before they were due to meet, he filled up his car with five gallons of petrol, handed over the fuel coupons. This is during the time of rationing. Uh, so fuel was rationed, but. Don't forget, because he because he was a company director of Hursley Products, which was Edward Jones's company, that actually gave him. I think I mentioned this early in one of the episodes. This actually gave him fuel rations, which uh, were really important because um, you could only have uh, fuel if you had ras- uh, coupons. Um, uh, he said to Mary, "I have an appointment at half past one, and I look like making it." He was alone in the car at the time. As mentioned, at 3.45pm, he was seen driving the other way uh, in his Alvis car, uh, heading towards Crawley, and noticed a woman in the front seat who matched the description of uh, Olive Duran Deacon. Uh, Morris was actually sh- later shown a picture of Mrs. Duran Deacon, and he, he, oh, burpees, he confirmed it was it was her, or he looked like her at, le- at least. Oh, burpees again. Um, there's this whole hoo-ha in, the, in this story about... Uh, um, 
uh, Johnny had Mrs. Duran Deacon's uh, fountain pen. I took this out of the story because it really throws you off. But um, he'd got her ration books. He'd got uh, he'd got loads of different things that he'd taken from other people. And he he actually accidentally, when he was uh, later on refilling up with fuel, he accidentally left it at that garage as well. And then had to come back to find that pen because it was like, shit, I've just killed a lady and that's her pen. Um, uh, what else was on there? Fountain pen, yes. I don't want to go into that too much. Oh, yeah, no. So 21st of February, so this is three days later. This is around the time that the body would have fully dissolved, around 8 a.m. Haig returns to that garage. Uh, Morris Loudner, the owner, says, Haig, who did I see you with in your car last week in Crawley? Haig made no, no reply. And Morris said, after all, you're a single man. Why hide the fact? And Haig said, it could not have been me. Of course it was him. It was his car. It was his Alvis who Morris serviced on many occasions. And don't forget, this is in an era when uh, this is late 40s. So there's there's only around 300,000 cars in the United Kingdom. Do you know, this is not... Uh, I don't know how many there is today. There must be millions. There must, uh, there must easily be a car per person. Uh, but... Uh, oh, I removed this line. This was going to be at the end of the uh, episode, but I... I um, I was about to let out a little Tommy squeak and then, whoops, a bit windy today. Um, I moved this line. This was going to be at the end of the episode, but I moved, removed it at the last minute. Um, uh, Johnny's last full day was spent in the condemned man's cell at Wandsworth Prison. He slept, smoked cigarettes, enjoyed the tea and toast, and wrote a long letter to his beloved parents in which, which he expressed no remorse for any of his victims. Instead, he relished the adulation of the tabloid press, having become... Did I did I put this back in? I might have put this back in. Yeah, I I might have put it back in in the end. Uh, his last request was that his famous suit, which was the one that he wore at the trial, be donated to Madame Two Swords for his waxwork to wear, which it was. So actually, uh, it's not it's not there anymore. But in Madame Two Swords in London. Um, down in the basement where the uh, where all the, the murderous stuff was. They got a Reg Christie one. But next to Neville Heath and uh, Dr. Ruck, in the middle of them was was a waxwork of John George Haig. So by this point, he'd already become a little bit of a celebrity. The trial was pretty quick, but the, the tabloids were all over it. And people were like, oh, do you know, this is fantastic. Oh, look, a murderer. Uh, so he'd become a celebrity. So by that point, he was enjoying all of the, the press attention that he was getting. And he was like, oh, great. Well, if you're going to have a waxwork of me, why don't they wear my exact suit? Uh, and it did. So there is a, if you have a look online, there is a photo and you'll see the waxwork of John George Hagen. That is his original suit. Uh, There's some medical info in here as well. So there was a, a big bit that I took out as well. If you read many of uh, Hague's statements, he gave... I'll do this when we do the um, uh, the letters episode. There's, there's a lot of letters I want to read to you, uh, which give you a better insight into who Haig was. It won't be a story. It'll just be me reading letters. But um, there's this whole bit in there that I've deliberately erased because it is bullshit, um, which is that when Haig realised, just after the moment where he goes, uh, he asks Webb, uh, where, are, where are Symes and Barrett? And, and Barrett goes, uh, uh, I, b I believe they're, they're working hard in order to get you hanged. Um, after that bit, Haig becomes a little bit nervous about the fact that, oh, shit, what? This, I'm probably not going to get away with this. So instantly he turns around to Webb and he goes, he, he starts talking about uh, uh, the insanity plea and ha is it possible to get out of Broadmoor? And, you know, so he goes for all this. And then every statement he gives after that point, he starts going on about uh, how... With all of his victims, he drank a pint of their blood first. And he, you can see him add it in, and it's just... You know, you can see that he's already planning. He's going for his defence plea, which is that he's insane. You know, it's the coward's way out. Instead of just going, yeah, I did it. I, you know, I wanted their money. It's, he's like, oh, I'm insane. You can't execute me. Uh, so there's a lot of that. that got, I, I deliberately took it out because I thought... It, it threw, if we had an extra episode, I probably would have done that. But I, it, it's, 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 not, it's not worth much. Anyway, um... Uh, there was a letter just uh, a letter from who was it from it was his medical information 
Uh, is it from? I haven't written who it's from. That's really annoying. It's in Brixton Prison, so it'd be. Uh... Anyway, uh, uh, dear sir, I'm directed to inform you that having carefully considered all the circumstances of the case of John George Haig, now underlying sentence of Wandsworth Prison, and having caused a special medical inquiry to be made to the person to the prisoner's medical condition by Sir Nor Sir Norwood East uh, and others, etc. Uh, under Section 2.4 of the Criminal Lunatics Act 1884, the Secretary of State has been unable to find any sufficient grounds to find justifying him in advising His Majesty to interfere with the due course of law. So that basically went, no, you're not going to get off. Uh, I think I, I'll post a picture online, but I've got a picture of the um, uh, the plea. Oh, not the plea. What's it called? The uh, appeal. Uh, and I've got a picture of the uh, the statement that where they gave where where it goes. This man is to be executed. Uh, there's loads of them. When you when you go into uh, the the archives, it's really interesting. They've got a whole file which is just full of all these statements of people going right on this day. This person is going to be executed, and here's the royal the or the the, the governmental seal. Uh, what else? Da, 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 da. And let's not do that. Oh, is that all I did? Oh. I thought there was going to be more on there. I think I, I think I'm oh, I'm saving a lot for the letters episode, so I need to plan that. That's going to be good. That'll be interesting. The letters episode. Uh, you don't have to tune in for that one. Literally everything you've got is in this episode. But if you want more information, it'll it, you know it'll be an episode where I can just we can just sit down, and just uh, go through uh, details. <sighs> so that was sulfuric. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, so. End of Murder Mile. We've got the uh, uh, Q and A episode and the letters episode and the omnibus episodes, and then that'll be that done. Uh, that'll end us for this year, and then January I'm off. Hurrah! Uh, end of January back into the archives, uh, and then Murder Mile will return. So, uh, probably, I haven't really set a date for it yet because I want to. I want to work out how many of the uh, the files I can get access to and which ones I'm going to cover and. So, um, I'll probably return end of February, I think. End of February, start of March. I haven't quite decided yet. Um, but uh, we shall see. We shall see. So, that was all good. Hope you enjoyed that. Hope you're all having a good a good Christmas and a new year and all that. And wishing you all lots of things and uh, happiness and etc. Good. Time to go. Time to go. Time to a uh, cake to eat. Cake doesn't eat itself, you know. Right. Um, have your have yourselves a good year, and I'll see you in February or March time ish. Best wishes. Lots of love. Bye bye.